right? So you might get a little pop up there. Welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube as well. My name is Jamie Vivak, and I am the Will County Coordinator for uh, the Conservation Foundation. Want to welcome everybody to today's webinar on oaks. Just to let you know that because this is a webinar format, everyone's muted, your cameras are off. So hopefully you can see and hear me. I cannot see or hear you. Um, also that little hand raise thing that's in, I usually turn that off. It's not letting me turn that off today. Um, but because it's a webinar format, can't really do anything with it. So I get sometimes we accidentally hit it though. So no worries. This webinar is being recorded for everyone to enjoy later. As I mentioned, it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel. I generally get them up within about 24 hours, so it'll be right there in case you missed a part. Um, if you have a question, please use that Q&A box. It, it really helps to organize the questions better. Sometimes they can get lost in the chat. So um, I'll be monitoring both though throughout the webinar. So, um, but again, if you have a question, please use that Q&A box. For your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in chat, but just in case I missed a setting or somebody gets around it, whatever, please don't click anything other than what Nancy or I might post in the chat. Um, on the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered to the public for free. However, we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. Uh, if you click the little box, basically any donation gets you a membership. So the more people we have attending, the more it does cost us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you're going to be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things you might be interested in. Um, our butterfly wet, uh, brochure, our bringing nature home brochure, our rain garden brochure, all that kind of good stuff, but it'll also have our virtual tip jar there. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help keep us running. And also, again, as I said, makes you a member so you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. So as those of you who have attended our webinars know, we do these every Wednesday at one o'clock. So upcoming webinars, I'm really excited about next week's. September 9th is gonna be Raptors in Your Neighborhood. I'll be joined by Wings and Talons, which is a rehab group for raptors, the bird, not the dinosaur. I always clarify that. Um, and they will have some live birds to show us. So very, very excited about that. You'll get to meet virtually some of the raptors that live right here in Northeastern Illinois. So very exciting. I can't wait for that. I really wish we were doing it in person, but that's okay. It'll be cool anyway. So. Um, please, please join us next week for that. Um, and real quick to answer Jennifer's question, yes, anybody can become a member, even if you're out of state, even if you're outside our normal service area, we welcome everyone. So, and it just helps us do this work and all the rest of the work that we do. So appreciate all of those of you who have donated and become members, thanks to our webinars. So it really looks good for me too. So thank you to everybody for doing that. With that, I am going to ask Nancy to turn on her camera and her microphone. There's Nancy. Hello. So I want to welcome Nancy Sonatel, who is one of our TCF staffers. Uh, I first met Nancy as an educator. I used to lead up our education program, and Nancy does some of our youth education programs. And then she stepped into an even bigger role, helping out our watershed groups as well as our conservation at home program. So without further ado, I am gonna turn it over to Nancy. All right, thank you, Jamie. I'm going to share my screen here, maybe. What does it say? not getting the options I normally get. I'm getting advanced sharing options coming up. Have you seen that before, Jamie? Oh, it's because oh, you, we go. Yeah, you here we go. it. There you go. All right. And then, from the beginning. And I think I need to X out of here. All right, is this looking good? Well, welcome. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, happy you're joining us for our presentation on oaks. I'm, as Jamie said, um, a program assistant at the Conservation Foundation. I have my contact information here in case you have any questions, uh, follow-up questions for me, but I'll also have it at the end of the presentation. So 
thing. Why is it not advancing? Hmm. Seems to be stuck. There we go. So before we, I get into the presentation, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Conservation Foundation in case you haven't um, seen one of our webinars before. Um, we're, our organization has been around for about 50 years and our mission is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas, open spaces, protecting rivers and watersheds, and uh, promoting stewardship of the environment. We're um, proud to say that we have recently been accredited by the Land Trust Accreditation Commission. Um, in order to get that, you have to meet the highest national standards for excellence and conservation permanence. We expect to be around for a while. As Jamie mentioned, our primary um, area in which we work is uh, DuPage, Kane, Kendall, and Will counties in Illinois. In addition, some also some, we're moving into uh, De DeKal, LaGrange, and Grundy. We do some work there. Um, we also have partners that we work with in the wider um, Chicago area. And our headquarters are at McDonald Farm in Naperville, where we have an organic farm. We are um, happy to say we've been involved in preserving 35,000 acres over the last uh, almost 50 years, 200 parcels, 43 conservation easements, and working, as we said, in seven counties. And why is preserving open areas so important? Well, it plays a big part in imp uh, improving and preserving our quality of life. So open spaces along rivers and streams can help protect water quality and improve uh, the water. Open space improves air quality. It helps preserve wildlife, which many people enjoy. And then um, it provides an opportunity for people to get outside, uh, particularly good for kids, of course, when they're growing up to get playtime outside. And I think in the last few months, there are many, many people have appreciated the freedom of being outside, not feeling like you have to wear a mask and just enjoying the normalcy of the seasons coming along. And we also think that we have a responsibility to future generations uh, to preserve our natural areas. And we do all of this at the Conservation Foundation through education for people of all ages, um, promoting environmental stewardship. So we periodically will, will lead um, work groups, clearing out invasive species and that sort of thing. Um, we work with people and um, forest preserve districts for land preservation, individuals I should say, and forest preserve district people for land preservation. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, I work, um, I do bookkeeping for uh, some outside work groups that are very active in cleaning, monitoring, and uh, restoring our streams. We've worked with developers to put in sustainable developments, and then we have our Conservation at Home program, which works with individuals. So we're going to talk today about what makes oaks so special and why we should be paying particular attention to them and getting them back in our landscape. Just a few basics about oaks. They're a deciduous tree. So obviously they leave their, lose their leaves in the fall. Um, they live in the Northern Hemisphere all around the world, not, not just in the US. The genus is Quercus. And most important, they are a keystone species around the world. So that means that they support the local ecosystem better than almost any other tree. They provide critical food, shelter, habitat. Um, the animals in the area. They also um, have the highest, oaks have the highest amount of biomass. They can, they have the ability to clean air and they're big um, and provide flood control and other water management. They, um, starting with the animals in the U.S., 
And there are 100 or more vertebrate species that eat acorns. So in our area, that's going to be squirrels, chipmunks, um, even birds like turkeys, crows, blue jays, wood ducks, who knew? <laughs> um, rabbits. I wouldn't have guessed rabbits ate acorns, but they do. And deer. So, and, and many, many more, of course. And oaks support many, many insects. Um, the, the number of species of Lepidoptera, which are the moths and butterflies um, that are supported by native trees is amazing. According to research by Doug Tallamy, oaks support 534 species. And here's a list of other native trees that are also very beneficial. And I, I included this just so that you could get an idea of how important it is for us to put in native trees, because even though non-native trees may be very pretty and we, you know, we're happy to have some of them around, um, because they have not evolved in the, here and they haven't evolved with the insects in this area, they do not, the insects are not able to utilize the leaves of the trees um, for food and such. So it's, it's like a food desert for moths, for caterpillars basically, wherever they're coming from, moths, butterflies or whatever. Um, so it's very important to put in all sorts of native trees, but the oak is uh, the biggest one. And they, of course, provide shelter. The old, older oaks get holes in them, um, become hollow in the center, but as long as the um, periphery is in good shape, the xylem and the phloem can flow up and down and, and still feed the tree. Um, that provides nesting sites for raccoons. Very fun if you ever have seen a raccoon peeking out from a hole in an oak tree. Um, they look so cute, but also wood ducks and, and other birds make their nests in trees. Oaks have such a big impact, um, partly because of their size, but they have extensive root systems, which help stabilize slopes, which eliminates um, or limits erosion. Um, that's slowing that down, the erosion and the water runoff, allows groundwater to recharge. We really need to be getting water back into our groundwater and not running it off the land and down to the ocean. The wide canopies that oaks have dissipates the rainfall, so that allows for slower uh, saturation. As I mentioned before, they help reduce air pollution and trap airborne uh, particulates. They provoke, uh, in an urban area, they help you know, with noise abatement and temperature modulation, there's, um, there's good evidence that it's very important in urban areas and in the inner city um, to have trees in neighborhoods. There's some studies that have shown that even crime goes down in neighborhoods where there's good tree cover. Oaks are good for carbon sequestration. Um, 100 metric tons of carbon dioxide can accumulate in one acre of forest. The carbon footprints of 18 average Americans can be neutralized by one acre of hardwood trees. Well, right there, that, there's a motivation for putting in more, um, more oaks and more hardwood trees. And interestingly, managed forests can accumulate more carbon than unmanaged forests. So that's another reason for us to be paying attention to our woodlands and taking care of them. And another thing for oaks is that the best trees for carbon dioxide um, absorption have large trunks and dense wood, and that definitely is what oaks provide. And for all those good things that they do, they also live a long time. Here's a picture of a 300-year-old bur oak in Wisconsin. Um, I've heard, I think generally speaking, they say that they live to about 150 years to 300 years. But of course, it depends on the conditions they're growing in and how much development happens around them or, or anything else. So this one was probably out in a pasture. Something has been relatively undisturbed for all this time. 
So I think it's interesting what some of the research is revealing. Um, some things that I hadn't known about oaks, and one of those is that they originated in Southeast Asia before the continent split, and they migrated to the east and the west. Um, when the continent split, they ended up in different areas. North America does have more species than any other area. Um, and it's interesting that one of our species, the Sadler's Oak in Southern California, is related, most closely related to the Armenian Oak in the Caucasus Mountains. So that definitely helps to, um, uh, I don't know if it proves it, but it sort of supports the point that um, oaks started elsewhere and migrated. So in nature, animals rarely hybridize, or if they do, they have sterile offspring. Um, but what's interesting is that white oaks, and that's a large family of, um, it, was, it would be species, a large species of oak is the white oaks. They freely hybridize within the white oak family. And by doing that, it appears that they're able to capture favorable genes from different species, and yet remain morphologically distinct. So they still look like what they are, um, like a bur oak is in the white oak family, so it'll still look like a bur oak and have bur oak leaves, but it must, it may have some genes from other trees in the oak, white oak family. So I thought that was really fascinating. Um, Jean Romero Severson and her colleagues at the University of Notre Dame are studying, uh, studying southern live oaks to understand how the trees have adapted to climate change during glacial periods. And what they theorize is that when the ice is advanced, the oaks have retreated south. And when the glacier retreated, the oaks moved north. And this repeating climate change that we've had thousands of years ago may have led to the diversity of oaks. So there, for instance, there are live oaks in Mexico that are obviously related to the live oaks in the southeastern part of the United States, but they can't handle the colder temperatures farther north. So just really interesting. And she and her colleagues think that um, there are two, two dozen red oaks and close to two dozen white oak species in eastern North America that have the same set of genes that allow them to tolerate the cold. And what I think is um, one of the most interesting ideas here is that with all of us being so concerned about climate change, I feel like what we're learning about oaks gives us hope that the oaks at least will be able to adjust to this. So we may get southern oaks moving north, and maybe some of the oaks in this area that don't really like it so hot will move farther north. Um, but if they're the kingpin of the ecosystems and the oaks are able to adapt, and move around, um, I think that's a very promising idea and gives me hope anyway. So here's just a visual of the, the range of white oaks in um, east of the Mississippi River. They are very tolerant of many soil types and moisture conditions and tolerate um, a lot of dense canopy in its youth, which means uh, there are a lot of things that can't grow up if they're in the shade. Um, and but oaks seem to be tolerant of that so they can once they make their way up tall enough they can catch some sunlight so in the chicago area um, a group of um, partners have started the chicago region trees initiative and this group you can see is um, consists of local like the morton arboretum um, but also the U.S. Forest Service, so range of organizations, and they're working together to develop and implement a strategy for healthier and more diverse urban forests. Um, where we are in this area, I'm out in DuPage County, we're not, it's not urban as in the city, but it's still very um, developed, and so all of this area, both the city, the city of Chicago and the surrounding suburbs need to be thinking about um, creating an urban forest, not just a problem for the city. Uh, there, the envision of the uh, Chicago Region Trees Initiative um, 
is to ensure for the future that the region's tree population is broadly understood and valued, that there are collaborative management opportunities that are um, identified and put into practice, that we can see measurable improvements in the health and vigor of the region trees, and that public awareness and support is established so that the ongoing management can, um, can continue. Uh, the group did an urban forestry assessment and um, discovered there are about 157 million trees in the surrounding in Cook County and the surrounding um, counties, collar counties we call it. The tree canopy covers about 21% of the land area and the most common trees are, there are only a few, but they're buckthorn, European buckthorn, so not a native, green ash, this is from their website and I'm not sure green ash would still be here because of the emerald ash borer. Um, I'll have to double check that. Box elder, black cherry, and American elm. And as you can see, oaks are not listed there. So the um, initiative identified some critical issues. And those are the significant presence of buckthorn and other invasive woody species. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the loss of the ash trees has been substantial. Uh, for anyone who lives in our area, I'm sure you've seen that. Just, you know, amazing the number of ash trees we had here. Um, and whole blocks were sort of denuded when the trees had to be cut down. There's been a... Um, Oh, economic downturns, uh, of course, means that people reduce the amount of funding that they put into caring for trees. So that can be a problem. Of course, we had a significant downturn 10 years ago and seem to be in one now. Um, lack, there's a, a great lack of regeneration of native oaks. So we still have, you know, a number of very large oaks around, but there hasn't been the right conditions for, um, next generation to come along. So that's a significant concern. And then of course, you know, we've had lots of development, uh, which has uh, taken over, taken out woodlands and such. And, um, and then of course we put in houses and driveways and roads. So there's a lot of imperious, imperious? And any grant, imperious ground cover. I didn't type that, but I know that wording doesn't make sense to me. But impervious services is, I think, um, what I want to say there. There's limited species and age diversity in publicly owned trees. I mean, that was part of the problem with the emerald ash borer is that cities tend to get on this thing of like, oh, we're, ash trees are nice. We're going to put in all ash trees or, um, and, and they don't, haven't been thinking in the, in the last decades about diversity. That also happened with the, one, with the Dutch elm disease and so many elms died. Um, so having a variety of trees in addition to oaks is a very good idea. And then there's been a lack of education and outreach to private property owners who um, manage the majority of trees within the municipality. So they're in our backyards and our parkways and um, yeah, mo most land is in private property owned by pri private individuals. So we need to be cognizant of that and, and take that on as our own responsibility to help out here. And then of course, changes in the climate are a concern. There's another organization, the Chicago Wilderness Organization, which was a um, group of individuals came together in 1994 to start this group. And they worked together to develop a biodiversity recovery plan for the, um, the Chicago area, which they called the Chicago Wilderness. It's really a significant ecological area with a lot of diversity, um, with the lake here and lots of moraines and different, um, features based on, you know, the glaciers being here and then receding and such. And I just wanted to read what, what they envisioned because I think it's something that we could all relate to. And that is 
imagining a region filled with life where children splash and play in clean, in clean creeks, where people learn to gently and respectfully enter back into a positive relationship with the nature that surrounds them, and where rare plants and animals and natural communities are nurtured back to health and offered a permanent home next to our own to the benefit of our health and our economy. Today, Chicago Wilderness, working with partners, has developed an Oak Ecosystems Recovery Plan. So, here is an image of the prairie woodlands and wetlands in the 1830s. So the the sort of background gray that you see it looks gray to me anyway. The majority of what you see on that picture is prairie. The green is woodlands and uh, red shows settlements and blue shows wetlands. So you can see it was mostly prairie but quite a bit of woodland along the streams of course. So here's another picture and in this picture um, the, pre the gray, the dark gray is pre-settlement oaks. So you can see I haven't put the picture side by side, but you can see that a lot of the woodlands were actually oak woodlands. And if you can see, I know this is a little bit hard to see, but the blue areas here are not water, but what's left of the oaks in, 19, in 2010. Only 17% of the oak woodlands are left, and 70% of those are on private land. So there's been a significant decline in the number of oaks. So that kind of brings us to you and me and what we can do. So in thinking about what we can do on our own property or, or whatever group we get involved with to um, help with woodland restoration, we all need to be thinking about the soil because it's the foundation of all plants growth. The soil provides nutrients and stability for the plants to grow. Um, composting, which is like the leaves fall, you know, in the woods, nobody is raking up leaves. They fall to the ground and they decompose, providing nutrients. Um, they support living organisms in the soil and um, help provide minerals for the, for the trees and the plants that are growing. So it helps to maintain a healthy balance. Um, and we need to limit the use of chemicals to keep our soils healthy. So I have more to say about soils that I thought you might find interesting. Every teaspoon of healthy soil is home to billions, imagine that, billions of microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, nematodes, insects, and, and earthworms. Uh, the worms and the insects chew and shred the leaves into smaller bits so the bacteria and fungi can access them. And then those the bacteria and fungi break down the dead plant and animal material, which then becomes nutrients for the plants. The earthworms create pathways in the soil that fill with air and water for plant roots. So a lot of people don't think about this. I mean, they know plants need water, but Plants roots also need air. So compacted soil, which is what you get around in new developments where they've removed the topsoil, then compacted the clay and put a thin layer of topsoil back around the new house. It's not a good uh, environment for plant roots. But creating soil by leaving your leaves and giving all these organisms a chance to work will help improve the soil. There are also specialized um, symbiotic relationships with fungi that they develop with plants, which is really interesting. They bring hard to reach nutrients and water directly to the plant roots, and then the plants provide the fungi with carbohydrates. Very interesting. It's also interesting to note that trees get twice as much nitrogen, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus when they have fungal partners than when they're just using their roots alone. So that means they're going to be healthier. 
And then as I mentioned, the trees provide sugar and carbohydrates to the, the fungus. And the fungus can take up to a third of a tree's total food production. Who knew? Not I. Fungi produce uh, plant hormones that direct a tree's root cell growth to the fungus's advantage. Isn't that interesting? And fungi filter out heavy metals and ward off destructive bacteria and fungi. So knowing that makes me think that I need to be cognizant when eating mushrooms about where they've grown, where they've come from, because that's one of the things that mushrooms do is filter out heavy metals. And then they're tree specific fungi. So oak trees work with oak milk, crap, um, milk cap fungus, which increases the ability of the oak to take up water and nutrients. The pine tree fungus will release a toxin if the soil is deficient of nitrogen, and this toxin causes small organisms to die, which then decompose, returning nitrogen to the soil. And I just have to say, I am continually fascinated by the way things in nature work together um, to make things happen. It's just, it's just amazing. So trees communicate with one another through their roots. Uh, their fungal networks pass on chemical and electrical signals. They kind of operate like a cable network where the filaments, the fungal filaments, penetrate the soil. And then through those connections, they can transmit signals from tree to, to, to tree to ex, uh, exchange information regarding insects, drought, and other dangers. Over time, a single fungus can cover several square miles. And like tree soil, uh, fungi can live hundreds of years. I took a lot of this information out of The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wolobin. So all this information tells me that soil and creating a soil where um, the fungi can live will be helping our trees to live. So part of improving the conditions for oak trees, whether you have one oak on your own property in your yard, or whether you have a small woodland, um, I'm gonna be offering some things to think about to, to uh, create a better habitat for the oaks and your other trees. So turf grass really doesn't belong under trees. This is a picture of a, a woodland and you can see that it's just covered with all sorts of other herbaceous plants than grass, which, um, needs a lot of water, so it soaks up water and um, does not really add anything for the trees above. And it doesn't, really, it doesn't really look well because it doesn't grow well in the shade. So sedges are a grass alternative. Sedges grow in all sorts of different conditions, but uh, one thing they do do are there are a number of species that will grow in the shade, even dry shade. Uh, which is something that's very hard to find plants that will grow in, in dry shade. So not everybody has an open woodland like this where you could put an oak sedge, um, but I wanted to show you what it looked like and that this would be much better for the trees. Interestingly, if you're in our area at all, the, I noticed uh, last time I was over in Glen Ellen at, um, near Lake Ellen, that the park district there has stopped mowing under these trees and it looks like they've got something like oak sedge in there. Much more natural and better for the trees. So you may not want that look that I showed you on the last slide, but there are other things you can do. Um, you can put a few oak sedge plants around the base of your tree and then you can add other native ground covers. Uh, on the left there you see some uh, trillium and then bluebell, um, Virginia bluebells in the backyard ground on the right. There's a lot of wild ginger and it looks like celadon poppies in there. Um, so both of the the ginger and the poppies, uh, if they're getting adequate, well the, the ginger will stay as a ground cover um, all season. Uh, the poppies will too if they're getting enough water. 
here's another picture of what one can do in a shady area of your garden um, under your trees to help improve the condition growing conditions for the trees and here i'm seeing wild ginger uh, looks like some wild geranium the bluebells some um, salmon seal ferns and the ginger the salmon seal the ferns um, will all keep their leaves and, and provide something interesting to look at through the summer and you know you can always throw in a couple of hostas to provide um, you know you know better better design if you need a few more things to fill it out. So the other thing we really need to think about in improving habitats for oaks is to take out um, these invasive species. There, there are three main ones in our area that we are concerned with. Um, that would be buckthorn and bush honeysuckle, and I'll come to the other one in a minute. On the left, you can see uh, the buckthorn. Well, I guess what I want to say, one, one way to identify them without even knowing what their leaves look like, is they come out first thing in the spring and they keep their leaves last in the fall. Uh, native plants have evolved to know what to do in this area and how soon to come out and that sort of thing, um, so they don't get nipped. But these species um, sort of do their own thing. And so you'll see them early, early in the spring and late in the fall. And often along the edges of forest preserve districts, I see the screen of buckthorn um, like you see in the left picture. To identify buckthorn, here are a few pictures. Um, the middle picture is the little um, seedlings coming up. You can see on the left the glossy leaves. They do have thorns. Once they get bigger, um, you'll find long thorns on the trees. They've got the dark berries and a distinctive bark. So the smaller trees will have bark like shown on the right um, when the trees get bigger and there are some buckthorn trees that uh, are quite large. They have a little bit, their buck doesn't look quite like that. It's a little shaggy, but if you look at the leaves and you look for thorns, you'll be able, be able to identify them. And the thing is that um, you have to get the seedlings out pretty when they're pretty small or they're very hard to, to get out. They put a tap root down pretty far, so it's hard to dig them out. Um, and if they get too large, then really the best thing to do is uh, to use an uh, herbicide. Now, of course, we're not big fans of broad use of herbicides, um, but there are some species, invasive species, that are just pretty much impossible to get rid of unless you use it. And so we do recommend use of it judiciously. Um, another thing that I think is important to know about buckthorn and why it's important to take it out is that it emits a chemical called emodin, which it's produced in the leaves, the fruit, the bark, and the roots of the plant. It has laxative properties when eaten by some animals. And what we see, what is most visible to us is that it inhibits the growth of other plants nearby. So very often, if you see a thicket of buckthorn, you will not see anything growing underneath it. The emodin level is highest in the spring. And in the woodlands, that's where the action is. And the spring ephemerals come out before the leaves have come out on the trees. And that's when they can catch the sunlight. They go through their whole, um, growing season maybe in a week or two in the springtime um, so for the spring ephemerals not to be able to do that is a great a great loss you say um, spring ephemerals are important for the pollinators who are just coming out in the spring the emodin also causes low hatching rates with frog toads and salamanders it's a real problem in forest preserves and other areas where they may surround a small pond which is a great place for um, you know the spring spring peepers and um, toads and salamanders to be laying their eggs and it can cause deformities it's it's really a problem moving on to honeysuckle 
Um, you can see the leaves here with the red berries. There are a couple of different honeysuckles in this area, the Ammer and the Japanese. Um, they can grow to be quite large. You can see from the picture on the lower left, quite a lot taller than that person. And uh, they too shade out, or they may have a chem chemical that they put out. I'm not sure about that, but they definitely shade out other things, so not much can grow underneath um, often. And then we have garlic mustard, which is actually an herb, and it was, you know, something that people used. Um, I think it comes from England or the UK, but anyway, Europe, not, um, and it releases a chemical that kills beneficial fungi. Um, so that reduces the ability of native plants to compete for nutrients. Um, it takes over easily. You know, it has a competitive edge over the native, other native plants. And, you know, this is an important thing to think about is that in Europe, there are over 30 insects that attack its leaves, stem and seeds and kind of keep it in check, as well as herbivores that will eat it. But in North America, there are no such enemies. And that is the problem with these invasive species. Where they have evolved with the insects and such, there are animals and insects that will eat them. And it's, it's a balance. Um, it's, the animals help keep the plants in check, but when we bring these other species over here, that sort of thing hasn't evolved and so they can kind of run rampant. So we highly recommend that the garlic mustard be removed. It's a biennial, biennial, so the leaves will show up the first year and then the second year it flowers. And I actually have found that it's take the time to clear out an area and then probably do it the next year that you can really um, get rid of it pretty pretty quickly. When creating habitat for oaks or just in general it's important to think in terms of diversity, um, animals that need it and, and the different plants we need to put in. We need to think about spring, summer, and fall because pollinators and the animals need to eat in all those seasons. Uh, I want to talk briefly about planting and layers and, and the importance of that. So starting with the canopy, which is going to be the big trees like the oaks. Um, here's some of the oaks that are common in our area that are good to think about putting in. The northern red oak, the white oak. There's the white oak family and then there's the tree, the white oak just to make that clear. And the bur oak, which is in the white oak family, what a magnificent tree, isn't that gorgeous? Just amazing. Swamp white oak, chinkapin oak. And something what we all need to think about when we're putting in any plants, really, but since we're talking about oaks, I'll focus on that. The, there are different oaks that fit for different microclimates and soils. So red oaks like soil that's mesic to moist and part shade. They're one of the oaks that can handle some shade. And just in case you're not fairly familiar with the term mesic, it just means soil that's not too wet and not too dry. Medium. Burr oaks can take dry soil or moist soil. So you can find them growing on the floodplains, but also on bluffs or out in fields. Um, and they can take clay, which is a good thing because we have a lot of clay in this area, but they want full sun. White oaks like dry or moist soil, so they're pretty versatile too, but they don't want it too wet. They don't want their roots sitting in, you know, flooded for a while. Um, and they prefer full sun. Now, pin oaks like wet areas and full sun, so that would be a good oak to put in if you have a wet spot in your yard or you have a pond, you're living near a pond and you want to put in an oak, you would choose the pin oak. Chinkapin oaks are tolerant of a very high pH and are drop resistant good street trees. So they would not be happy near a pond, but if you have a place where you think um, the soil, you know, the grass, whatever gets very dry, you know, the chinkapin might be the oak to choose for that spot. And I also wanted to mention that there are other good trees uh, to put in if you have the space. Um, 
these are trees that grow along with the oaks in our native woodlands. So oak hickory forks are very, um, well, I was going to say common, but to the extent that we have woodlands left, they're common. Um, black cherry you'll find growing with oaks, and Kentucky coffee tree, hackberries, basswoods. Now I put in black walnut and I know they have a bad name, but if you have a woodland setting, it's not a problem. And uh, the plants that have an issue with black walnuts are usually the non-native plants because they didn't evolve along with them, but there are plenty of native plants that uh, grow under black walnuts. If you go to any forest preserve or some a place like that where it's, those plants have been growing there together, um, not artificial, artificially planted, you'll see plenty of things grow under black walnuts, so you just need to be selective about what you plant under them. And of course, they can be kind of messy, so I'm not sure I'd put one in my yard, but uh, if I had a little woodland patch, I probably would. Good food for the squirrels. And then I wanted to mention maples, um, because, well, one thing I wanted to say is we have so many maples as street trees that I'm not sure we need to add any more. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're bad trees. The sugar maple tended to be on bluffs where it was drier, higher and drier, and silver maples would be a little bit more of a floodplain tree. Um, both good trees, but they've been overplanted in our cities, so I really wouldn't recommend adding more. Um, and another interesting point is that the maples are not um, fire resistant the way the oaks are. So when there were fires on the prairies, the fire would come whipping across and would be stopped by a river. So because the maple trees uh, couldn't tolerate the heat of the fire the way the oaks could, they tended to grow on the other side of the river. Um, and they tend to grow more on uh, floodplains. So just something to keep in mind about maples. So the next layer that we have in our woodlands that I think we need to um, sort of copy in our urban areas, and that is the understory trees. So that would be um, bushes and small trees, bushes, shrubs, small trees that don't grow to be taller than say about 25, 25 feet. And one of the good things about them is they don't take as much space. Um, it is a height at which a lot of birds want to um, build their nests, so you're providing habitat for the birds, and just adding a little diversity to our to our landscapes. So most of us are familiar, at least with look, by looking, um, by the looks of it, with the redbud tree, which is a lovely one. Here are a couple of dogwoods. The gray dogwood is more of a shrub look, but the pagoda dogwood on the right um, grows into a small tree and has a lovely shape. Both of them provide berries um, for food for the birds in the fall. Nanny berry is another nice shrub to add. Provides, you know, flowers for the nectar for the, the butterflies and the bees in the spring and berries in the fall. The blue beech or American hophorn bean is a nice tree that doesn't doesn't take up a lot of space, doesn't grow too tall. So if you need a tree um, to fill a spot, but you don't want it to be too big, uh, one problem of putting a big tree next to your house is, well, of course, it takes a while for them to grow. But the problem of having them there is you don't want limbs falling on your, on your roof in the future. And some of these smaller trees are good to plant closer to your house because you don't have to worry about that kind of damage. There are many more trees that I, I could mention for understory trees, but I just wanted to give a sampling there. And then the next layer, the core of the bottom layer um, in the forest, we call it the herbaceous layer, is just all the smaller things that, that grow. And this is um, um, a residence uh, garden, but it was a woodland garden. And had a tour and it was thought it was very attractive. Got a lot of pictures. So I mentioned before the spring ephemerals. Um, they're a wonderful thing to add to your, to your landscape. On the left is hepatica. 
and on the right is spring beauty. The spring beauties will even mix in with your grass if you don't. Um, well, I guess they would, I don't know if herbicides would kill them or not, probably, but um, I, I enjoy seeing spring beauties in the grass. So they're one of the first ones that come out in the spring. And then blue phlox is lovely. It smells lovely. Such a pretty color. It's a good one to add, whether it's in a, a large planting on the right or just um, mixed in with some other things like you see on the left, which is actually in the woods, which I see a little Solomon seal, um, toothwort, fern. Virginia bluebells are very pretty. Now, a lot of the spring ephemerals will um, die back. As I said, a lot of them will grow, bloom, go to seed, and die all in about a couple of weeks. It depends on how warm the spring is. Um, and bluebells are just wonderful, but they do need to be interplanted with other things because uh, the leaves die back and you won't see them the rest of the year. Jacob's ladder, wild geranium are very nice. They both keep their leaves if, if they don't, it doesn't get too hot and dry. Ferns, celadine poppies are nice ones to add to your landscape in shady areas. Bloodroot, these, these all last few are all ones that will keep their leaves, give you something to look at um, when you're under the trees. And then, um, just a couple of comments about yard maintenance. Um, again, removing invasives. You can use loppers or saws to remove the trunks kind of flat and close to the ground so you don't trip over them and then apply the herbicides immediately. Uh, you don't want the, the top of the stem or the trunk to dry out before you put the herbicide on. And then you wanna leave the leaves and branches. As I mentioned before, the leaves provide nutrients for the plants. So um, kind of crazy that we clear out our flower beds. I mean, it makes sense to take it off the grass, but although I mulch, mulch the leaves as much as I can. Um, but in our flower beds, we, we really should be leaving the leaves because it just improves the soil and gives the, the organisms in the soil something to eat. So for those of you who live in our area and have added lots of natives um, to your property or are eager to do so, we have a conservation at home program where we'll um, come out and visit and give you advice. Um, and then uh, we have a sign so you can get certified to say that you are doing sustainable landscaping. And this, this is for those doing good things for the environment and those who aspire to do so. That's our Conservation at Home program. So that's the end of my presentation and I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone has. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Nancy. This has been absolutely fascinating. Um, the first question I'm, I'm gonna ask, and I will back this up with, I did a little bit of research while you were talking just so that because I wasn't sure you were going to have the answer to this. Um, but I Sandra might, asked, What's the not. chemical from garlic mustard that kills the fungi? I don't know its exact name. Okay, yeah. so so do you have that? There, there is a ton of research on it, it's actually a combination of chemicals, um, flavonoids and glucosinolates. So, it, and it's it quickly going through some of the research papers that are out there on it. One I found was actually uh, out of Harvard. They did research on garlic mustard in Europe where it's native, as well as here in the United States where it's not. And they found that those chemicals are actually um, stronger or, or more reactive. To, they kill more of the fungi in the soil here in the U.S. than they do over in Europe. So that's fascinating. Yeah, really. One more example of that sort of um, that arms Imbalance. race, that Darwinian arms race that's going on between <laughs> um, organisms. So over in Europe where it's native, those um, mycorrhizal fungi have evolved to 
not react to the chemicals that the garlic mustard puts out where here they they just haven't had enough time yet to react right. to that. So right. um so it 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 that effect is actually stronger here in the US. So I thought that was really kind of fascinating. So Yeah, that's great um, information. Thank you. I I just I thought I would put that out there. So all right. So other questions that we had um, Marion wants to know if uh, your source for, you made the comment that managed forests accumulate more carbon per acre than unmanaged forests. Do you mm. know where you got that source? I do not know offhand. Yeah, sorry, I don't, don't have that offhand. Send us an email if you really want to know, if you want to follow up on that, yeah. and we can look into that and get back to you. Yes, please do if you, if you want that answered. So my email address is the one that sent you the invitation for this webinar, um, and you'll get a follow-up on that as well. Those emails come to me. So jvbach at theconservationfoundation.org is my email address. So go ahead and send me that. Um, Jennifer wants to know, is there any way to stop people from cutting down trees just because they are a nuisance? Well, I would say on someone's private property, no, you really can't stop them from doing it. I, I think the only thing you might do as a neighbor is, um, you know, try to get them to put something else back in um, that maybe isn't, wouldn't create the problem they were trying to eliminate. Um, you know, if it blocks their view or something, can they put down something smaller, put in a butterfly? garden instead, you know, try to talk to them about the benefits of having it, um, having something there. Education. Education. Yeah. So, you know, just helping us to educate people on um, why trees are so important. And the other question is, what are the trees they're cutting down? Because as you mentioned, if what they're cutting down is actually buckthorn and honeysuckle, that's good. We want that. But then, you know, maybe help them, send them to us and, and you know, we can help ad advise them on things that they can replace that stuff with. Um, right. The Morton Arboretum actually, at, through the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, has a great guide on um, healthy hedges. And it's uh, trees and shrubs that you can replace honeysuckle and buckthorn with. So um, definitely that's, that's a really good resource to check out. Agreed. All right. Um, Sandra wants to know what are the trees on the slide that are understory? So I'm not sure if she wants to know the, the like the definition of an understory tree or just which ones are considered understory trees. Uh, it would be the ones that uh, that were the red bud, um, dogwoods, uh, I mentioned the blue beech, um, I, I left out viburnums because there's a uh, there's a leaf, with the viburnum leaf beetle that's causing problems for viburnum, so I didn't want to recommend putting those in. Um, there are also there's hop tree. Um, there's quite a few. If you want a, if you want a more extensive list, send send us a email. And we yeah, can send definitely. You more all right, David asks, would you say the best plant for under a tree is no plant, but a layer of donut shaped mulch? <laughs> Definitely uh, don't volcano mulch. You, you got that one, so that's good. No yeah, volcano mulch. Yeah, no volcano mulch. mulches. Yeah, it really should not be more than about three inches because as I mentioned, uh, you know, trees need to have access to air. Um, so, so yeah, you don't want to suffocate them, but I would say that wood mulch is better than grass, um, but to the extent that one can add some some native things under there too, would be a good idea. And the, and the more ground cover you have of plants, the less you need to mulch, because they will shade out the the weedies, the weeds that mostly grow from seed and that need light to sprout. So you can basically mulch by having a ground cover um, shading the area. And kind of as a, as a follow-up to the previous question too about educating the neighbor, um, she went on to clarify that he said he didn't want to clean up the leaves. This is the perfect thing. So leaving the leaves uh, is actually better. And yeah. 
there are some people you're just never going to reach. Some people just have it anchored in their head that they want their yard to look like a golf course. And you're just never going to be able to reach those people, unfortunately. But the good news is a lot of younger people, and I, I, I'm counting my own generation going back, um, are, they don't want to do all that work. There's so much work involved. And we've got so much else to do. We've got kids that were taken places and we've got maybe elderly parents were taking care of lots of other things, lots of better things we'd rather be doing than spending hours and hours and hours on our lawns. So these upcoming homeowners tend to be the ones who are listening more to the, hey, leave the leaves, mm -hmm. leave it more natural. And that's okay. And so that, that's really good. I think we're getting that educational message out to people that this is really a environmentally better than spending all that time trying to clean everything up and getting rid of every leaf on your property. Right. So that's, that's my little soapbox on that. Um, Anonymous says, we have a 15 year old Black Hill Oak grown from a historic tree in our town. It doesn't lose its leaves in the fall and it's had damage and broken limbs due to freezing rain and heavy snow in the winter. Is there any solution to this other than human intervention to prevent the, leaf, the limbs from breaking? Hmm. Well, my, my first thought about, um, about the leaves not coming off in the fall is that some oaks don't drop their leaves um, right. in the fall. They can keep them even through the winter. Uh, if you think that that's causing a problem with, you know, from snow damage and, you know, the weight of the snow and such, I just wonder if um, some judicious uh, pruning of the tree would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Might might be worth a conversation with an arborist. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Sue says, I have a tree in my yard that is large and big thorns. Are there any native thorn trees? Um, well, the locust. Well, yeah, locust. Uh, hawthorn? Hawthorn, yeah. They, they would call, I would, I mean, locusts are, hawthorns aren't really understory trees in that they don't grow on the edge of the woodland so much but um, they are about the same size. They're smaller size trees. So if it's a really large tree, it sounds like a native locust is what I'm thinking. I can't think of another one with thorns. Send us a picture. Uh, We'd be happy to help you try and identify it. Yeah, need to see the leaves. Yeah. Grace says, is there a smaller oak that could work in a relatively smaller suburban yard, Southern Exposure? Who would I work with to make this decision? I live in Lake County. Hmm. Lake County Conservation recently merged, I think, with Open Lands. Well, you know, one thing, one thought I have about that is it takes a while for them to grow to be huge. And so what's the harm of putting one in? And it's going to be a smaller size tree for a long time and someone down the line might decide to cut it down because it's too big. But it's going to be an oak growing there for the next 20 or 30 years and be yeah. a medium sized tree. So, I mean, that's, I, I have um, enlarged the flower beds at my house and have a couple of burr oak trees, two houses away. And I have little oaks coming up all over the place from the squirrels. Yeah, and so I've, I've left some of them, you know, I've left some of them that I think are in okay places to keep growing and really wouldn't, normally plant trees that big, but I figure, you know, they can do their, um, they can add to the value of, of having oaks in the neighborhood um, for a while and somebody else can make the decision down the line to take them out. That's my philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question says, as the tree matures slash ages, does the benefit to the environment lessen? I would, Say if anything, it improves. Yeah, that's what I, I was mean. You know, too. in terms of biomass and and the amount of carbon dioxide they're dealing with, and and uh, water uptake, uh, water uptake, and yeah, the cooling. Yeah, I didn't really talk about where to put an oak, but I mean, big trees can cool our house considerably. Um, that so passive solar is awesome. Yeah. Um, Kelly wants to know, when is the best time to plant an oak? 
Uh, well, pretty much spring or fall, it's really okay to plant in the fall because the, um, the trees are gonna be working on um, getting their roots acclimated um, first. And the soil is warm by the, uh, the end of the summer and stays warmer than, than the air for a long time. So even if you plant in September or October, the tree will have a, a good couple of months to um, just get its roots um, settled in, so to speak. Okay. Um, Sandra wants to know what the tree species on the understory slide was that had white flowers. Was it maybe a... Uh, yes, so that service was berry? service berry. Yeah, I service don't think berry. I mentioned okay. that, service berry. Okay. All right. I think, let's see. And oh. those berries are edible, by the way. <laughs> For us. <laughs> uh, one last question. Uh, Sue says, I planted a red oak in my backyard about 10 years ago and another one in my parkway replacing an ash tree about five years ago. What should I watch for to maximize their health? I think just, you know, providing them um, something other than grass growing under their um, their canopy, however small it is. Um, would be the thing to do and, and you would enlarge that as time goes on. Making sure maybe they have a little bit of extra water during drought periods. Oh, definitely. I know uh, Skeet, our friend from Bartlett Tree Service who did a webinar with us a few weeks ago, um, he has a Tree Friends newsletter and last two weeks mm -hmm. he's been talking about water, water, water. Um, and you know, trees, for the most part, especially native ones, can handle the little bits of drought that we get here and there, but you really want to help, especially with younger trees, make sure we give them a little bit extra water, especially like now. Yeah, and in our, um, yeah, I mean, the urban environment is harsh for trees uh, in general, I would say. Um, and so even the large trees, I think, uh, can stand some extra water. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our webinar for today. Thank you all so much for attending. We really do appreciate having you all join us. And thank you, Nancy, for giving us all this very fascinating information about trees. Um, one last time mentioning uh, Doug Tallamy's book, Oak Trees. The no I, I was actually in a webinar last night where they were talking about um, cleaning up in fall or not cleaning up in the fall and mention just how many insect species use oak trees. And it's something like 400, I want to say like 437 different insects use oaks as a host tree species. It's, it's just insane. So oaks. And a lot of insects overwinter in the leaves that you leave in yeah, your flower definitely. bed. Definitely. So, definitely. So yeah. It's amazing stuff. Yeah, so definitely consider oak trees if, if your yard has an appropriate place for them. Um, they are really, really phenomenal trees. So thank you all so much. Thanks again, Nancy. Take care, You're everybody. Welcome. Have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.